Everyone, I want to thank you for your patience. We were waiting a couple minutes to allow um, a number of people to join um, the webinar. I hope you all had a nice Labor Day weekend and are getting back to library business today on Tuesday. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, patron problems today. We're going to address on a broad scale patron policies. Um, dealing with the patrons and how to handle um, not only interactions with the police but also uh, your own internal uh, interactions with respect to appeals and other uh, other internal library uh, handling of these patron complaints. Um, one of the things that I like to do when I talk about problem patrons is I want you to understand a little bit about the nature of the library and what the case law has been as far as uh, past litigation involving patron complaints. So you can get an idea of what has worked and what hasn't worked for other libraries in forming their policy. And it will give you a good idea of why um, I will be recommending and your lawyer will be recommending that your policies be drafted in a certain way. Let's see. One of the issues, the first we want to talk about um, is how to, and bear with me a second while I'm trying to change the slide on this. Uh, the constitutional standards that um, govern libraries. Again, the nature of the activity and the type of governmental unit you are depends and it will, it will uh, lay the groundwork for what you can regulate and how you can regulate it. Um, Courts have stated that the First Amendment does not guarantee access to property simply because it's owned or controlled by the government. And this is something that we're going to get into and explain how you are different from other, uh, from other, liber from other, from other types of public entities such as universities or cities or uh, other, other local units of government. So what does the First Amendment guarantee? First Amendment right, you have a First Amendment right regarding uh, what you are viewing. This is often something that you're you know, is heavily discussed in the library community, your traditional ideas of censorship. You know, you can't tell someone what they can and can't view as long as it's lawful. So when we draft policies, we have to make sure that the policies don't unfairly infringe on this particular First Amendment right. But what's more important, I think, for um, the sake of this particular type of policy, a patron behavior policy, is this little known First Amendment right of the right to receive information. This is a right that the courts have recognized that includes some level of access to a public, public library. And the reason that it becomes important for you to understand is that we understand that when you tell somebody to close a book or to take something off the internet that they're looking at, that you could be impacting their First Amendment right if they're viewing something lawful. What is also important to understand is that each time you ban a patron from the library or deny access of any type, even limited access, let's just say, for example, that the library decides to ask a patron to leave for the day, you are impacting that patron's First Amendment right. It's not to say that you can't do it, but we want to make sure that you do it correctly and do it um, subject to a lawful policy. So a patron says to you, this is a public building, I pay for it with my taxes, you can't tell me what to do. The question is, uh, is that patron correct? And the answer is no. Um, you are in a public building, that's correct. Typically they're paid for by taxes or bonds or some other type of financing from the public. But that doesn't mean that the library opens itself up to all um, types of behavior at all times. A library is a limited public forum. Again, you don't need to be open to the public at large, but maybe open to a specific class of people. And we're going to get into a little bit about what the case law says on this, but I want to, um, you know, talk to you about some examples that, you know, may be clear to, to patrons themselves. You know, for example, I couldn't stand up in a library and deliver a political speech on top of a table and have the public at large view that to be an acceptable use of the, of the library. Um, it's pretty easy to see that that would disrupt patrons and the use of the library. So that's what we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on what, what the purpose of the library is and how clear rules can help further that purpose and keep, keep the library environment in the way it's supposed to be. 
One of the main cases that we're going to talk about is Crimer versus Bureau of Police. And I want to talk to you about it a little bit, and I want you to understand what the facts are, only because if you actually get yourself into litigation with a patron, um, if the patron is savvy enough, and, and you know, fortunately for us, we haven't, we, you know, haven't been involved in, in too many of these uh, cases that have gotten to the courts. But in the ones that we have been involved with, Strangely enough, the patrons will have reviewed the case law, and oftentimes they'll have read this case, and as a matter of fact, this Crimer case has been cited by patrons in defending themselves against library policy. So it's important to understand what the Crimer court said and how to tailor your policies so they're in compliance with this particular uh, line of case law. What happened in Crimer was that there was a homeless gentleman who was using the library. And the person, um, this individuals end up um, being banned from the library for some period of time, mainly because the person was using the library um, in a way that wasn't, you know, conducive to good library use. For example, this individual was sleeping in the library and um, not using the library materials while in the library. And one of the significant problems in the Crimer case was that um, this particular individual's body odor was such that it was almost impossible for people to be around him and use the library. So the library uh, ended up uh, banning this particular individual for, for a, a certain amount of time. And the court said ultimately that the library was uh, permitted to do so. The library may promulgate and enforce reasonable regulations governing the use of its facilities. Um, one of the things um, that the court found to be acceptable, and, and a little bit later I'm going to give you some actual examples from library policies and the way it's worded, and we can talk about this in more detail at that point, but uh, the library in the Crimer case had a rule that required patrons to be using the facility, um, the library facility. Uh, again, there was an allegation that this may unfairly impact the homeless, but the court ended up finding that rule to be reasonable. The library does not have to be used as a lounge or a shelter. Um, again, this is you can tell how uh, library patrons become savvy in this regard. A, a number of um, libraries that have problems with loiterers or people who uh, use the library mainly for warmth during the winter will will tell you oftentimes that these individuals will come in and. Um, sit down in a chair and have a library book in front of them. And as long as they're abiding by all the other policies and quote unquote using the library, the library uh, would be hard pressed to remove that individual. So again, there's the patrons have become very savvy about their rights and their responsibilities with respect to library use. Um, this is one I find particularly important because a library can prohibit disruptive behavior. Again, going back to the speech issue, um, it's, that's a pretty obvious example, but the courts said, and this is a direct quote from the court, prohibiting disruptive behavior is perhaps the clearest and most direct use to achieve maximum library use, direct way to achieve maximum library use. So many of the policies that are out there, many of your policies probably directly relate to prohibiting disruptive behavior, and it's important that we do that in a neutral way and in a way that it doesn't unfairly impact any particular group or a specific person based on what they're reading or what they're doing, but based on, in fact, what they're doing. So not to get too technical, but the legal, the legal standard for review would, is, is this here on the slide, that the time, place, and manner regulations are permitted if narrowly tailored to serve a significant governmental interest and leave ample channels of communication. Um, so if we take this standard, and this is what the courts use to look at, for example, the regulation in Crimer that required, um, what one of the regulations in Crimer was that a person uh, could not have offensive body odor that would create a nuisance. Um, the court, again, went back to look and said, you know, this goes back to disruptive behavior. It's this person's body odor is preventing other people from, you know, enjoyment of the library. And addressing the, you know, leaving ample channels for communication, they basically said that there's other, you know, in order to, that this would leave other opportunities for this individual because if he or she, for example, came in, you know, compliance, their body odor became um, such that they weren't causing a nuisance and weren't causing problems for other patrons and staff, that that person could come back and use the library. So there were other, 
you know, means to be able to comply with the policy, reasonable means. And so that particular part of the library's policy was upheld. So one thing I want to focus on here is that Crimer, you can see that it was upheld because there was a written policy. And one of the things that we haven't discussed yet, but we'll address it in, in greater detail later, was that there's also an appeal procedure. Again, because any time that you are taking away one of those First Amendment rights, the right to receive information in a public library, you have to give that individual due process. And due process simply comes down to notice and the opportunity to be heard. So what the, what the policy has to end up doing, and we'll, again, we'll, we'll discuss this in greater detail, is to uh, give the person notice, notice of what, what behavior has caused a, a violation of the policy, notice of what policy provision that individual has violated, and gives that person due process, which is a reasonable opportunity to be heard, um, basically an appeal procedure. I want to contrast the Crimer case with the Armstrong case because the facts are substantially similar, but in Armstrong, the decision, uh, the library's policy was not upheld. Again, it was a homeless man barred from the library, but the policy prohibited, prohibited objectionable appearance. And the court found this was too vague because it was subjective. You know, one person's idea of objectionable is uh, you know, may differ from person to person. So the court found that this was not a reasonable standard. Um, in contrast, you know, in, even in citing the Kramer case, they found the nuisance standard was objective because it has a legal meaning. Um, nuisance, you know, if you look up nuisance case law, there are objective st or uh, objective standards to that uh, to that term, where objectionable was found to be too vague. So again. When you're reviewing your own particular individual's uh, or your individual library's policies, go back and look for words like that. Is it objectionable? Is it, um, you know, we see that or improper, for example. Those are types of words that you really have to look at and say, is this something that we can apply um, an objective standard or is it going to be too subjective based on the individual person who may be enforcing the policy? Also, another case we want to discuss is um, Brinkmeyer versus City of Freeport. Um, this involved a library employee who was approached outside the library by a man and who handed her a har what she referred to as a harassing letter. And we are we are going to get into what what the library can and can't do as far as protection of employees because this is one of the areas that I see is the most um, almost the most important for our library clients, making sure that they're uh, staff does not feel harassed on the job and making sure that we can um, put some policies in place that prevent harassing behavior. So this is what happened here. A library employee um, approached uh, or was approached by a man who handed her a harassing letter and he was eventually removed from the library. In this case, again, the court did not uphold the library's policy because it was an unwritten rule that the library prohibits harassing and intimidating patrons or employees. So again, one of the one of the things that we've um, learned from these cases one you have to have a written policy, an unwritten policy, or you know a policy based on well this is the way we've always done it is not going to likely pass uh, constitutional analysis from the court. Also, we have to make sure, and what this case tells us is that um, we have to make sure we're really very clear about where this applies. There was no geographical limits here. For example, the court noted that the, you know, you can't harass a library employee. Well, what if that, you know, a library employee happens to be grocery shopping after work and you're in the grocery store and a, a person who happens to be a library patron comes up and starts harassing her. Does the library really have, I guess for lack of a word, jurisdiction to handle that issue? So one of the things that we um, recommend, and you'll see this in the way we draft policies, is that the library should be very clear about where their policies apply. Typically we add a statement in the beginning that says that um, the library, this you know, patron behavior policy shall apply at the library, at any library building, at any uh, branch of the library, or on library property unless otherwise specified. And the otherwise specified um, is something we'll get into a little bit when we discuss the individual policy um, sections. 
again, and there was no procedure to appeal the suspension in Brickmeyer. So again, the court found that this particular library's policy was lacking for those two, two reasons and did not uphold the suspension. So this is a summary. When libraries must keep these constitutional standards in mind when developing policy, and this goes for your patron behavior policy, this also applies to your media room policy, your internet policy, so keep this in mind when you're drafting any policy that may impact uh, the library patrons and their use of the library. Clear, specific conduct, okay? Um, we, you know, we are often asked by clients to review patron behavior policies and other policies. And we do that. And we say to the client at the time, typically, um, you, may, you may be back you know, talking to us in, in several months or next year because the specific conduct may change over time. There may be something that happens in your library that you could not have anticipated. Um, I still get calls that, frankly, surprise me, things that people do in the library. And you look at the library's policy, and it just doesn't cover you know, some things that you may not you know, contemplate that someone would actually do, you may not have specifically, you know, provided for against that conduct in, in your policy. So again, your library board, you know, keep in mind the focus here is on trustees as board members, um, you should understand that you may, that you're, you may see your pol patron policy several times a year. It's, it's a living document and it's constantly evolving. Um, again, clear specific conduct should be identified and prohibited. Um, restrictions should be limited to time, place, and manner. For example, um, we we get this more often, I think, in the context of internet policies. You know, when you talk about you know uh, limiting somebody uh, f for what they are looking at. For example, if you walked up to a patron who was acting inappropriately at, let's just say, um, he was. Uh, committing a crime or an intended crime or, you know, violating the other part of your patron behavior policy at a uh, internet, you know, while on the internet looking at porn. If you, um, assuming that the pornography or what other material he's looking at is lawful, to, you know, kick him out of the library for looking at that lawful material would be something that would be related to the subject of what he was doing. But if you kicked him off of the terminal because he was committing a crime or because he was being disruptive in some manner, those are restrictions that are limited to time, place, and manner. You would have kicked him off the terminal had he been look, listening or looking at CNN.com, for example. That's, that's the goal of the library is to make sure that it's time, place, and manner restrictive. And then again, the availability of an appeal. One thing I also want to talk to you about is the, um, the cases involving the tr patrons who don't believe that the rules apply to them. And this is almost the most difficult um, patrons to deal with because um, sometimes people in general become so um, entrenched in their beliefs that they um, can only see the way their behavior affects them and doesn't see how it affects um, other people and affects, um, you know, the library globally. Um, so we often write policies that deal with patrons who don't uh, believe the rules apply to them. And these often come out on paper as sort of common sense. Um, for example, this was case actually got to litigation, um, the 9S versus Board of Trustees. A patron uh, refused to wear shoes in the library and was removed on several occasions from the library for failing to wear shoes. You know, they had a policy that said you are required to wear shoes in the library. Um, the patron argued that going barefoot was a symbolic speech entitled to First Amendment protection. So by going barefoot, you were in kicking him out. That was his First Amendment speech, um, and the court the court disagreed with that. So, um, and the court upheld the library's rule um, for w requiring shoes. The sad thing for the library is that they had to go through the litigation, and um, it came out in the report. Uh, in the reported case exactly what the health and safety reasons were at issue. You can see the library report showed that they had taken samples from different parts of the library and there was blood, feces, vomit, semen, and broken glass all at the library. Um, and not just in the bathroom. That's what the patron argued, that this was limited to just the bathroom. He should be able to wear shoes everywhere else. Well, unfortunately for this particular library, these materials were not limited solely to the bathroom. So you can see where um, a valid health and safety reason 
was given and was uh, agreed to by the court. So the court found that the rule was reasonable. One thing that's important for libraries is that um, the, the library argued and successfully argued that it not only protected the patron, but also protected the library and the taxpayers from litigation expenses that may result from injuries to barefoot patrons. So the library was able to look at um, look at its policies from a more global perspective, not only protecting the patron from him or herself or protecting other patrons from you know, patrons, but also the library is allowed to look out for itself and protect itself from litigation expenses that may result from injuries in patrons' use of the library. So putting all these um, court cases together, you, I think you're going to start to see a picture of where we are going with respect to what particular um, items should be listed in a behavior policy. And this, this is not by any means an exclusive list of things that you should deal with. This is something that um, we, we we're throwing out for discussion and for, you know, comments. Certainly if you guys have any questions or comments, you know, please post them. We're happy to deal with those as we go. Um, but again, critical to have a policy, a written policy when dealing with removing patrons Again, limit the conduct to library building grounds or both, and clearly address the specific conduct that will result in the suspension of library privileges. This is the key elements. And we're going to discuss some specific behaviors here. Um, one, of the one of the provisions that we include in, in every policy that we do is committing or attempting to commit an activity that's in violation of federal, state, or local law, ordinance, or regulation. Um, for for some of you that are city libraries, you may have specific ordinances related to the library, and it may be a very simple call to the police department. Um, for those district libraries that may not have specific ordinances related to the use of the library, you can still have a policy that would prevent uh, people from committing um, violations of federal, state, or local law. And this would cover, for example, um, any uh, any assault that occurred in the library, you know, we've we've had um, circumstances where patrons have um, assaulted other patrons. One instance was over um, there was a fight over one of the new release newly released books that they were fighting over. So this is some of the things that you can you can do to kick them out. I mean, obviously we're going to talk about um, specific behavior. And what we recommend doing is that when you, if you have a, a patron incident and you end up removing them, we like to cite um, one or more. You know, if they're if they've committed several violations of your policy, we like to name you know any violation that they've um, committed. So, you know, if they're loud and disruptive, that might be a violation. But if they're loud and disruptive and assault someone in the process, then certainly um, committing or attempting to commit any activity in violation of federal, state, and local law. Um, this would also cover any anybody that we noted, for example, that was um, com looking at child pornography, committing copyright infringement, something that may not be as open and obvious as an assault. It would be any um, act that involves sexual violence or you know sexual assault in the library. All of these would be covered by this. Now, as we'll get to a little bit later, some of this may involve um, contacting the local or federal authorities. But again, there's two issues that you have to look at when you're talking about behavior policies and enforcement. One, what is the library going to do about enforcing its own policy? And two, whether uh, you need to get law enforcement involved. Another provision we recommend including is that the patron must be engaging in proper library activities. A patron shall be engaged in activities associated with the use of the library while in the building. Patrons not engaged in reading, studying, or using library materials or facilities shall be required to leave the building. And I noted here below, this rule was upheld by the crime report. Um, that requiring patrons to make use of the library in order to be permitted to remain is a reasonable means to achieve that end, the end being the um, effective use of the library. And this is one of those um, one of those kind of catch-all provisions that may um, be cited in connection with other provisions. Uh, for exa example, if you have a situation where you have um, a lot of disruptive high school students at the end who seem to be um, at the library, you know, not doing their homework or not um, reading or using the internet, but seem to be just horsing around 
loitering, I guess for lack of a better word, this is the type of um, provision that you can use to um, suspend library privileges to those people. Again, the idea, getting back to the focus, is making sure that staff and patrons can use the library and be, you know, be at work in an environment that's suitable for library use. So engaging in proper library activities is one way um, to achieve that end. Um, restrooms. Uh, I'm, the restrooms uh, provision in some of the first policies that we have reviewed were pretty general. You know, use the restroom in a way that you know is suitably used. But now we've actually had again. I talk about specific conduct. Again, we've added you know laundry, shaving, hair cutting trimming, bathing, and sexual activities prohibited. This may or may not apply to your library, um, but um, we've had incidences that happen in the restrooms that are almost hard to describe. So if this is something that's a constant problem for your library, take a look at your policy and make sure that um, it's specific enough about the conduct and make sure that people are using the restrooms only for their intended use. Harassment, this, this is the provision that I think is um, probably differs from policy to policy, um, and I don't think there's any specific right way to do it, but I want to point out a few things about that. Um, we, here you've get, you're given one, um, one way to, to state the policy, staring, photographing, following, stalking, harassing, or threatening library users while in the library or on library property so that it interferes with library patrons' use of the library or the ability of a staff person to do his or her job is prohibited. Um, you can add provisions in there that, you know, a little bit looser that, you know, could reasonably be believed to prohibit, um, you know, patrons from using the library. This is one of those um, policies that I think requires a lot of extra documentation, and, and we've been able to uh, successfully enforce it against patrons. But one of these things comes down to a he said, she said um, issue among, um, sometimes among staff and sometimes among other patrons. You know, often a patron will be staring at uh, an employee or another patron and that person will come to complain and then the um, patron who has been doing the staring will say, well, I was looking at the clock on the wall or I was looking at something else. So documenting this um, and making sure that you have enough evidence going forward um, to enforce this policy is something that we would recommend. Um, often it, it's um, statements by the person who's being harassed or statements from other uh, staff members or other patrons who have seen the behavior. Because this is some, one of those things that I think of, of all the policies can be considered the most subjective. But I think it's also one of the most important because when you have a library, you know, because you're a limited public forum, means that basically as long as they're using the library in um, a proper way, you know, in conformance with this, uh, with the library's policies and state law, the pa the patrons essentially entitled to stay. This is not like a private business where you can find someone kind of creepy or weird and you can just prevent them from using your establishment. It's it's not that way in a library. So. In order to properly protect your other patrons and your staff, you know you can use this provision, but make sure it's documented and do um, do a thorough job as far as the investigation and any documentation you can um, find to support the statements of the person being harassed. This um, provision also addresses um, um, also addresses um, you, uh, behavior with respect to staff, and it's, this one's really um, geared only to staff and some of the particular problems um, that a person may have with staff. Um, we get a, a number of these calls, and oftentimes um, you can have someone who um, the staff member is afraid of or is fearful of or does not want to be in the same vicinity of. And this is one of those things that if that person's behavior is towards your staff, um, prevents them um, from doing their job, they're going to be in violation of library policy. This is also to protect staff members from um, other types of patrons. You know, you may have the lonely patron who comes to the library and sits there all day. Um, the problem with some of these patrons is they may focus on one or more particular staff members. And the ones I've seen 
um, and it may be just the nature of the of the you know the the way the staff works together. But often they fix fixate on a younger member of the staff, um, and sometimes this can be intimidating, especially if the staff person you know you know is required to walk through the library or is you know shelving books or something like that, where that person is easily vulnerable to um, a patron monopolizing their time or um, trying to force the attention of that staff member on this person. It can also prevent um, people from you know, making sexual comments or sexual advances towards your staff members. So again, one of the primary concerns that we have is not only that patrons use um, the library in a way that it doesn't disrupt other patrons, but also it um, uses the library in a way that it doesn't um, prevent the staff from doing their job or, you know, frankly cause the staff member to be uncomfortable in their own place of work because that's something that does not need to be tolerated. And as long as you have the policies in place and enforce them um, in a consistent manner, we, um, you know, that's something that can certainly be enforceable. I see there's a question about um, patrons that may have some disabilities and that's an excellent question and I want to get into that. There's a slide on that a little bit later so I just didn't want um, that question to be ignored and remind me later if I forget it but we will address that in uh, in a couple minutes. Um, this this um, slide I like to say I would have liked to have said is sort of unnecessary, these policies, it sort of states the obvious, but um, unfortunately we've seen incidents lately where I guess nothing is a little too obvious. Um, one of the things that we've recently added is patrons should not be permitted in any areas designated as staff only or in the, or in the basement, for example, in this particular library unless permitted by the library director. We've had instances where patrons have wandered um, down down the halls or wandered into the basement and they've, you know, it's, it can be especially troubling if a, you know, a staff member is in a, the basement and doesn't expect to see anybody there and is startled by a, a wayward patron. Um, again, this is important if you have um, patrons that don't know boundaries. You know, we, we had one uh, patron make the claim that they thought that this particular, um, you know, that places marked in staff, marked staff only, it was like a yellow light, he said, that, you know, if, if he couldn't find anyone to help him, he could go in there. So it's something that you want to make sure that you're protecting your staff, that they have a place where they can go that, you know, patrons cannot just wander in and be permitted. And if they do so, um, they can be uh, asked, asked to leave or their privileges can be limited. Again, library phones and staff computers are for staff use only. Again, sometimes you have to state the obvious, but this is one of those um, items that we added for a particular library where people would come up and just pick up the library phone to call home or to call their mom to pick them up. You know, and, and I guess you can only politely say so many times, this is staff only, at some point you have to put it in the policy and have it be a, a lawful basis where you can start to say, look, if you don't, if you do it again, you're going to be kicked out for the day or for the week or whatever your, your particular library's policy is. Again, this is, uh, sometimes there's things that we feel that don't need to be said, but um, again, as, as we're increasingly see patrons who believe that the rules don't apply to them, you have to watch out for these types of, of behaviors and, and react accordingly. Um, producing or allowing any loud, unreasonable, disturbing noise that interferes with patrons' use of a library or which can reasonably be expected to disturb other persons. Um, and, you know, we talk about including electronic entertainment communication devices, cell phones, cell phones, and radio. This is one of those areas that this loud noise is sort of a catch-all um, provision. And we actually recommend if you have a particular policy in your library for where some a person can use the cell phones or um, how that uh, individual you know, whether they have to be on, you know, mute or whatever when they enter the library. I mean, I was just in a library on uh, Saturday myself where a patron, um, you know, the cell phone went off, a couple rings, person stood up, answered it, started talking, and, you know, walked out talking loudly on the phone. And, you know, it's a smaller library. Everyone kind of looked up. And it's one of those things that it can be very disruptive. So if you have a particular, you know, use of a cell phone, you know, you have to keep it on vibrate when it's in the library. Make sure that's specifically um, 
stated in your um, policy. This is the body odor provision that I was discussing earlier, the one that's based off of um, the um, Crimer case. And as you can see, it's not um, just personal hygiene, it's perfumer cologne. Sometimes that's more offensive to people um, than you know offensive body odor. But um, this, I went, I went, there was like a period of six months where I must have gotten five or six calls about this particular provision and adding it to a policy. So I know that this still can become a problem for, for libraries. And I almost think it's, it's it, it, it doesn't seem to, um, you'd think it would impact maybe smaller libraries in a confined space, but it doesn't seem to, um, the calls don't seem to come from one type of library or one area of the of the state. So I think this is sort of a can be an, an overall problem for the library. But again, you see that causes a nuisance. We have to make sure it rises to that nuisance standard and not just you know, uh, you know, giving some you know objectionable or other um, subjective uh, criteria. Here's just a list of other. Um, policy provisions that I want to talk to you about. Um, food and beverages, uh, again, that's going to be something specific to your library, and it's really, it really depends on, on your particular library. You know, do you allow food, do you allow drinks, do they have to be covered, do they have to be, you know, in a specific area? All this should be specif specified in your policy. Because if you have a person who consistently brings um, an open beverage to the computers and spills it and damages library property, you want to be able to um, enforce that behavior policy if it's a consistent problem that seems to um, you know, fall on uh, deaf ears with particular patrons. Also, unauthorized use. Um, we, this is one we recommend because um, there's a lot of patrons who we've seen refuse to leave at closing time or they walk in at five minutes to closing and, you know, want to just check out one small thing. Um, also, one of the issues we had is that we had a patron that kept coming back to one of our client libraries while on suspension. And um, although it seems again, like we're stating the obvious that if you've been suspended, you can't come back to the library. We wanted to um, have the ability to have um, other um, other um, suspension or other um, violations to kind of add on to the time so that that person couldn't basically infringe on their suspension and then as expect to come back within the original time that they were gone. Alcohol, drugs, obviously using drugs, open alcohol at the library would violate most laws, but you also want to be able to protect the library from somebody who may be on um, alcohol, you know, or under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Um, smoking, obviously smoking has become a huge consideration. Smoking in the library, no longer really an issue, but we get a lot of calls about smoking outside the library. and, and, and at this point, we have found unless there's a local ordinance or something that um, really, um, you know, dictates what you can and can't do as far as public building, public um, facilities in your area, it's really going to be particular to the library. You know, some libraries want the people to smoke only in a specific area outside. Obviously, you know, consider. Um, having the situation where, you know, the smoke won't come into the library may disturb the library. So that's one of the things that we recommend that you address in your behavior policies. Obviously, shirt and shoes, because of the case we previously discussed, that's something that should be included. Um, Handhandling, soliciting, and campaigning. Um, these are some um, issues that I want to talk to you briefly about. But we recommend, especially when you talk about campaigning, that you get advice from counsel on your particular library because there's no um, hard and fast rule about this. This is one of those issues that we that we talk about, um, beha you know, limiting behavior or addressing behavior in the library or outside the library. So, for example, um, most of the policies that we draft have a provision that says you can't campaign in the library. I think you can see where it's reasonable that, you know, going up to people when they're trying to read a book or a magazine and asking them to sign a petition or to, um, you know, listen to your political views would be um, something that would not be conducive to library use. 
campaigning outside the library is a different matter. And I have a personal opinion on it that I'll share with you, and then it's something, though, that I specifically would like you to talk to your own council about, because it often depends on where your library is, how it's situated, and where it is, in, frankly, in relationship to the public sidewalks. But campaign financing, petitioning, um, soliciting signatures, those types of things, the courts have held at the, you know, you talk about First Amendment rights, you know, the right to review material, the right, you know, you know, against censorship, the right to free speech. Political speech of this nature is almost at the top of the, of the, I guess, the pyramid of First Amendment rights. The courts look very, very carefully at any policy that would prohibit Can't prohibit campaigning and those types of things on public property, it's on public sidewalks especially. And there's one case on it that involves the post office that it basically, the court really looked at where the post office sidewalks were in relation to where the, you know, the where they joined with the public sidewalks to determine where um, a particular person could or couldn't stand to do campaigning. I guess my, my general feel is that um, you can be specific in the policy, and again, it might depend on the, how your library is situated and where, it, where the entrances are. But some type of campaigning should be permitted as long as it doesn't prevent um, ingress and egress to the library and as long as your patrons aren't unduly harassed. And the other thing you have to be very careful of when you talk about campaigning is that the political groups often collecting signatures, some of them are professional, and they often have a very good handle on what the law is. So if you go out there and say, hey, you can't campaign at the library, take your, you know, take your petitions to the local grocery store, they're, you know, nine out of ten times they're going to know that there's something wrong with that analysis. So again, this is one of those things that I talk to your talk to your attorney about and draft some language in your policy that addresses that. Because at the same time, I know, especially around election season, campaigning can become a real patron issue. You get a lot of complaints. People don't want to be harassed. They don't want to be approached. And, and those are genuine concerns. But again, that's one of those things that you, I really recommend that you talk to your council about. Um, distribution of literature. Again, a lot often, you know, when you talk about patron behavior policies, we've seen, you know, before how some of this can um, impact other policies. You're you know, you may have a bulletin board policies that allows um, certain types of leaflets to be left at your library. So make sure any uh, rules you have about distribution of literature also comply with what your library's bulletin board policy may also um, have. Because what you don't want to have is two conflicting policies with different um, um, impacts. Again, sales. You know, commercial sale, and unlike campaigning, commercial um, Speech is given less weight with the courts, and so they're more. What the courts are more likely to be a little more lenient with libraries um, limiting commercial speech. Um, this comes up a lot when you talk about the use of meeting rooms, and I just want you to be aware because we, a lot of meeting room policies or a lot of patron behavior policies says you can't solicit or sell anything at the library, which you know I think. I don't know of a particular case that's that's dealt with that, but it appears reasonable based on um, you know the same view of you know, you don't want to be approached, you don't want your patrons to be approached, you know, with some you know sales pitch while they're trying to read. At the same time, you might uh, um, limit yourself as a library and what you can do. For example, if you wanted to have an author come to speak to, at your library and you wanted to allow that particular author to sell their book or sell signed signature copies of their books, you might be violating your own patron behavior policy or that patron may be, or that author may be violating your patron behavior policy. So at times, again, we talk about where does this apply and how does it apply. Um, at times we exempt the library um, and the library's programming from some of these provisions because you want to make sure that under a proper, um, uh, under the proper situation that you allow some maybe incidental sales if they're uh, incidental to a particular library program at the library. Again, another behavior policy that often um, intersects or overlaps is uh, policy dealing with minors. Um, and minors become a really, I think, a tough challenge for libraries when it also comes to enforcement. Because you, I know I've seen libraries struggle with, well, what's the appropriate age for allowing a minor to use the library by um, himself or herself? And one of the things I want you to think about um, you know, when you talk about that issue is how does that affect patron behavior? Because what we're going to expect is that any patron using the libraries shall, um, you know, 
act in compliance with the library's policies. Um, and with that, you want to be able to enforce those policies, which may include, you know, limiting the per, you know a minor's use of the library. So, for example, hype, you know, hypothetically speaking, or just food for thought, would the library feel comfortable, you know, having, you know, basically kicking out or limiting, you know, or expelling, for example, even for a day, an eight-year-old or a seven-year-old. If you allow seven-year-olds to come to the library by himself, you have to consider whether, you know, if that person's being disruptive or screaming or throwing a tantrum or not using the library, would you feel comfortable sending that minor home by him or herself? And so that's one of those issues that um, I really see this as being um, something that really is uh, specific to the library and maybe the area and maybe the community. Um, so that's that's one of those issues. Um, one one thing I um, um, one thing I want to address it. I have had two questions, and one I haven't had a chance to read all of it, but it deals with um, I think some of the appeal procedure and privacy, and we'll be getting to that a little bit later. So if I could hold off on this, but one of them deals with um, firearms in the libraries, and that's an excellent question because right now. Um, there is no prohibition for, um, at least the last time I looked, for um, having a concealed weapon in the library. And this has caused problems. So typically we draft a weapons provision for the policy that says something like um, you can bring, you know, weapons are prohibited unless you, yes, you have a specific, you know, a license, you know, specific license or are authorized to carry, something to that effect, so that you can prohibit people from bringing, you know, certain types of knives and other types of weapons into the library, but it doesn't uh, conflict with a state law regarding um, firearms. This is a real problem, I think, for Michigan libraries. We've actually had a couple instances where um, firearms were used or brought into the library where um, they were allegedly brandished in the, as part of a dispute among patrons. We've had situations certainly where firearms are present um, in the parking lots and so forth. And I think they become a real problem, but it's something that we're, we as lawyers and you as library uh, um, officials and employees are really without power to do much unless you want to, um, you know, have the legislature amend the statute to allow the same type of exemptions that are given to other entities that would, you know, basically exempt the library from having to comply with that concealed weapons issue, because I think it can be an issue. Other times where, um, and again, addressing back to the patron behavior policies, um, you know, there, there, there are going to be policies where you're going to have to do exceptions. That's one of them. The other is. Um, bringing animals into library. You can prevent people from bringing their, you know, pocket pets in their purses um, unless that pocket pet or other animal is a service animal. Service animals are specifically permitted in, you know, by law in the library. So again, when you're talking about um, enforcement of policies and drafting policies, there are going to be um, general rules, but they're going to have to be because of the law, and typically they're because of the law, that the law has granted exceptions, exceptions for concealed weapons and exceptions for service animals that might impact your, um, your policies and the way they're enforced. We talked about violations, enforcement, and appeal. So I, that was the, basically, I just covered kind of the policy, what your policy should imply, comply, and, and why you should review your policies to make sure they have those provisions in there or make sure they're addressed. Um, there are going to be provisions of the policies that are violated that don't rise to the police level. And what I'm going to cover is really essentially three topics. One of the topics is what does the library do and how it handles the appeal and library privacy issues involved with that. I'm going to talk about two types of um, issues involved with police, and they're sort of similar, so I want to be clear. One of them is um, addressing issues you may uh, encounter if you have to call the police. Okay, The library has to call the police and say, look, we have an incident over here. Um, we need your help, but we, we have to be clear about what, what you can and can't uh, tell the police because of the Library Privacy Act. And then the third part of the enforcement is really um, dealing with um, issues if the police come to you first about issues with your patron, con um, your patron um, c 
conduct in the library. For example, the um, patrons using your computers for illegal activities. Um, one of the, so getting back to the first part, this is we're talking about library enforcement appeals, something that um, that doesn't necessarily ri um, rise to the level of police involvement, or something that you're doing in conjunction with police involvement. Because if the police end up arresting someone and um, prosecuting them, it's technically, um, you know, when we've had police police officers say, say to these patrons, "You're not welcome back at the library." Well, typically they, you know, a lot of times they don't come back. But if they do come back. Um, that really doesn't have the force of law with respect to what the library can do. So the library may have to conduct its own, own enforcement and appeal provision um, in conjunction with the, with the police investigation. Um, and when we talk about enforcement of these policies, one thing I want to talk about, and a very good question was raised about that, is medical issues. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act impacts libraries. Um, when when um, you have a medical issue, it gets very complicated. And this is one of those cases where I do recommend that you have um, get your lawyer involved because at some level, if they, you have to assess, one, whether they actually have a medical condition that falls under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And if they do, you have to figure out whether you can um, reasonably accommodate their disability. And a lot of this is very, very um, touchy, okay? So, for example, if you have someone who has maybe Tourette's and, and screams and is disruptive, um, there may be things that you can do to, um, you know, be able to accommodate that disability without having to, um, um, you know, remove their library privileges because that's something that could get very serious if you remove their library privileges in violation with the Americans with Disabilities Act. I think that's going to be a real problem for the library. So that's one of those things that um, you may have to, um, you know, get get your lawyer involved in get you know, involved in an early stage to see, see if there's something you can do because, again, I don't think the Americans with Disabilities Act requires you to, um, you know, prevent, you know, endure every sort of behavior for an extended period of time, but it, you, you do have to give more leeway in the form of accommodations to people who fall within the act, and that's one thing. Again, it's really a case-by-case -case basis to see what's going on, how it violates the policy, and whether reasonable accommodations can be made. So I think that was the one of the questions. Um, make sure. Yeah. So again, I, I would I would talk to your lawyer, talk to your lawyer, and see what what if any reasonable accommodations can be done to um, to um, accommodate that patron. In in conjunction with that, there's a question about um, smoking medically permitted marijuana um, and complain of the smell. How do we handle that? Uh, again, that's an interesting question. Um, my understanding of the medical marijuana laws doesn't, this is just off the top of my head, so I think it's one of those things, if, the, if this is your problem, you should consult with their lawyer, but I don't believe it protects the person from smell. I think if that person, um, you're not, you're not going to be kicking them out because they smoked medically permitted marijuana, assuming that's in compliance with state law. But if they have offensive odor, offensive body odor, I guess to me it doesn't matter whether it's because of cologne or because of marijuana or significant um, smoke or because they haven't taken a shower in a couple weeks. I think it could all fall under that same um, provision with the offensive body odor provision. And, and I do not believe at this point that there's anything that, that protects um, even people who are medically permitted to smoke marijuana from um, you know, being able to, to smell of marijuana. So I think that that offensive body odor provision would still apply. Let's see. And here we're talking about the internal enforcement and appeal provision. Um, when, when we draft a policy, what we typically do is we typically have um, a statement that talks about what type of documentation that the library may have. And, you know, some have very formal incident reports, some of them are not as formal, but it's like anything else. I'm sure when you talk about your employment issues, you've been told document, document, document. The same really is true for um, internal enforcement of your, 
of your policies. It's going to be a lot easier to uphold a policy if this person has been warned again and again about the same behavior. Um, if they've been, um, you know, if they've been made aware, they've been sent a written notice. And that's the other thing. We typically recommend that you have a, a written notice to that individual uh, patron. Um, it's often hard to accomplish. You may not know who that person is. But, you know, for example, if you want to um, limit their library privileges and you know who they are by sight and they come back to the library, you can actually hand that person that written notice. You, if you know who they are because they're a patron and you have their address in the database, then you certainly can mail that person, email that person. Um, but written notice is, is the ideal type of um, notice that we recommend just so that they, and we typically recommend that you include a provision of your um, policy in, in the in the letter and, and often we have to be fully um, to make sure everything's you know beyond you know reproach we often indicate that they have the right to appeal so that they know that they have the right to appeal and that they can exercise that right and not have to show up to the library board two months later and say that they didn't know. Some libraries accomplish this by simply giving them a copy of the policy and letting them read for themselves others put it right in the letter. Um, let's see. Um, so you're also you should have specific suspension provisions um, in the policy, and specific reporting and suspension privi privileges. Um, we we used to again. It really depends on the library and what you want to do. A lot of the suspension privileges. Some of them are. Some libraries have very specific ones. You know, if you do this for, you know, you'll be suspended for the day. If you do this again, you'll be suspended for a week and then a month and so on. You know, but oftentimes what we like to do is a little give a little bit more flexibility. And that, we have also found that. Um, Having specific appendages, so we have two different types of suspension provisions typically in policies that we draft. One for, um, you know, privileges that affect the safety, security, you know, sexual um, assaults and so forth, and then other ones that don't. You know, I think there's a huge difference in my mind between um, the library's response to a um, incident involving someone bringing, you know, spilling the pot at the commuter terminal versus um, someone looking at child pornography or, you know, committing, a, you know, a lascivious act at the computer terminal. I just don't think, you know, s someone who does something that's severe should be able to be kicked out for the day and then you have to wait. I guess my thought is do you have to wait for them to watch child pornography again before you kick them out for a more extended period of time? Um, so my my thought about that is that uh, we often have we bifurcate it and we often give the library in the you know if you know they have a you know a specific provision if they you know violate more minor provisions but if they violate some of the major serious safety health safety welfare provisions then what we typically do is give something like an initial two week suspension and basically to allow the library to do the type of investigation we need to in order to determine whether um, that suspension should be um, you know two weeks or four weeks or, or a longer period of times period of time so um, we we talk about being very careful about privacy issues during the appeal and um, what we typically do is we don't um, um, we don't have a um, what we want to do is to make sure that the library itself doesn't violate any library privacy issues, okay? Because the Library um, the Privacy Act prevents library employees and agents and officers from revealing information that would be subject to library privacy. So this becomes kind of tricky when you talk about a patron appeal, but what we like to do is have the library be beyond reproach with this issue. For example, um, I'll give you an, kind of a hypothetical. If you have Let's say you have a patron that's been kicked out of the library for um, harassing, you know, another patron at the library, and um, that person feels offended. They were wrong. That's not something they did. Um, you know, they they were unfairly targeted by the library. And let's just say they go to the newspaper and say, "I was targeted by the library. They kicked me out for this." Okay, no violation of the Library Privacy Act has occurred. 
So um, what the library has to be very careful about this, especially if the patron himself or herself has made their name well known in the community with respect to this issue. What we do is we, we still have the library maintain privacy as if nobody knows that patron's name. So if the library, um, what the library's agenda should say is um, patron appeal, you know, for example, 2011-1. Hopefully you only have one for the year or two for the year. But, um, and then we refer to, you know, that patron will be referred to, you know, patron in appeal number 2001-1. And the reason that you want to do that is because as, um, we've seen at least in one case where um, one of the allegations is this in particular patron was to the circuit court. And one of the allegations against the library, um, and the claim got eventually dismissed in whole, but one of the allegations against the library was that they were defaming him. And one of the things that we were very careful and could you know, represent to the court without any um, you know, pause was that the library never released this person's name. So um, that's one of those things that I think as a library, you, you need to think about this in advance because sometimes we've seen it where it's kind of too late, you know, that they've, the library has listed on the agenda that, you know, Mr. Joe Smith, for example, is appealing his suspension. And in that case, it may be a little bit too late um, to maintain the confidentiality. So that's why we want to talk in the training session to make sure that that person's name is kept out um, to the extent possible because, again, you want to prevent that person from, from either claiming you defamed him or claiming a violation of the Library Privacy Act. Okay, so one thing we also want to talk about with your own internal provision is that, so the patron appeals it to the library board. Okay, what we do is we um, meet in closed session to discuss this issue. That's another way you can protect confidentiality. And the way you can do this is that under the Michigan Open Meetings Act, you can meet in closed session to discuss any material that's exempt from disclosure by statute. Well, the Michigan Library Privacy Act specifically dis, you know, says that library records are exempt from disclosure, which is why it's important to have written, written reports and written documentations of these um, events because you can go into closed session to discuss those written documentations and then the written decision of the director to uh, deny privileges. And then, so you can discuss this with your board in closed session and then come out of closed session and make the final decision on whether you're going to uphold the suspension, modify the suspension, or, you know, basically um, allow the patron back in. But again, in open session, you want to refer to that patron by some name other than his or her actual name, you know, like patron appeal 2001-11, for example. Um, once you do that, it's important to approve those minutes of the meeting and approve them, I guess, at the earliest possible time. One of, one of the reasons is you want to make sure that everything is documented in the minutes of the meeting. The second thing is that's when the statute of limitations starts to run on the, if they want to appeal to the circuit court. They have um, a certain amount of time after those minutes are approved to appeal to the circuit court and you want to get that um, time started as soon as possible. If you never approve the minutes, let's say your library board's kind of lax about approving minutes, they kind of get around to it after a couple meetings, um, then you know, you're just giving that particular patron more time to get their um, you know, appeal together and get it to circuit court. And this is actually one of the reasons um, one of the appeals was, was, was denied by the circuit court and one of the um, issues we were involved with is because he did not meet that time period. And that's very important for the library to be able to do that. Um, so that we had a question about um, Library Privacy Act and whether, and I think it goes along with this section about whether people appealing fees goes to the township board. Um, again, the Library Privacy Act only covers um, the library, its employees and agents, so I'd have to see about the way that that's drafted, but typically the library is not going to be, going to be able to um, control what the patron says or what other you know, people respond to that. So um, I don't, again, the question was, does the patron give up his or her privacy in such appeal? You know, I think it's certainly a defense, and I think that would be certainly something we would argue if that name got up. Out, but my, my thought was 
the, the library should do everything it's possible to prevent any library record from being disclosed. And so I would not, even if that name becomes public, I would still treat that person as confidential with respect to the appeal procedures and through, you know, at your library board level. Make sure that the library does what it can to keep that name from being released by the library or its, um, its officials or employees. Um, one of the things that's going to be important to know when you talk about enforcement is knowing when to call the police. Um, oh, I've got a bunch more questions. Hang on a second. Um, let's see. I didn't see these. If you bear with me one second. Um, one of the questions is, is it legal to take their picture? Um, my Mike, I, I'm assuming you're talking about someone who is violating library policy. I, if the library takes a picture of a patron, it should be treated as private, um, as with anything else, like, as you would their, you know, their history of what books they check out or their, their address. So if, if, for example, you take their picture doing something in the library and that becomes part of the evidence to support the decision to um, terminate privileges, certainly I think you can take their picture and you can use it internally, but again, it would be subject to library privacy, so it shouldn't be revealed in any way that violates the Library Privacy Act. Um, would the offender be allowed in closed session? Um, we recommend, it. The, it's, it's an interesting question, I guess the answer, the technical legal answer is that it's up to the, to the library board to determine whether the offender is allowed in closed session. Um, anybody can be asked in closed session as long as, as long as it doesn't violate the particular exemption here. And I think allowing the patron to be in closed session wouldn't violate the act if the, as long as the um, information being discussed relates only to that particular patron and wouldn't violate any, others, any other person's library privacy rights. Um, oftentimes what we would do would be to, um, they don't have to be allowed in closed session for the entire time. You could, you could allow them to come in, for example, and to give their side of the story and then ask them to leave before the board um, you know, goes on to further discussions about it. Again, due process, at some point, um, we, you, my recommendation is to allow that person to get their say in because, again, they might feel that they had their day in court then. You know, that if a board, you know, for example, they may feel wronged by the director or they may feel the director's out to get them. But sometimes when they're faced with, um, you know, a board, you know, a, you know, five, seven, eight members of a board, and in the particular board has listened to the story, and all of the board is in agreement with what what should have happened, then I think, um, then I think um, certainly um, that may prevent further appeal. It may not, and we've seen that it, you know, especially if you have a patron again that doesn't that doesn't understand that their behavior is offensive or that their behavior is in any way wrong. It's not going to help to have the appeal. They might, you know, go directly to the circuit court after that. But allowing the offender in closed session, I don't think would violate the Library Privacy Act. I don't. If it's just about their records, I would not violate the Open Means Act. But it is a decision of the particular library board. Um, and there's a question about patron coming to library board meeting to appeal suspension and speak at public comments. Would the meetings of the um, violate library privacy laws? My huh, my thought with that is, and that's something. It depends on. I would I would talk to your attorney at the time. But typically, if someone comes and reveals their own conduct at um, and, and talks with their, you know, talks. You know, it says my name is I, my name is Ann Searink, and I was you know kicked out of the library for you know drinking a beer in the library. If I reveal that myself, it's not a violation of the Library Privacy Act. I don't see anything wrong with it being in the minutes. So just I would just be kind of careful about the issue, be extra sensitive to it, and you may want to seek um, library counsel um, you know opinion before you publish the minutes. Um, Again, going back to the, um, I think we've covered some of these. Um, going back to the enforcement, you know, knowing, knowing when to call the police. If there's a crime that's been committed, or you think there's a crime being committed, um, you know, call the police. You know, don't, don't worry. I mean, I get this a lot from clients. They say, well, I don't know if there's, the evidence is going to be there. The person ran out the door. You know, they won't know who it is. Well, 
I, I think to get the to get it on record and you know to get to call the police and say you know someone was assaulted in the library and then the the you know perpetrator ran out the door, you know the the police may or may not be able to eventually catch and prosecute that person, but that's not something that the library should really be concerned about. The library should be concerned about maintaining the safety and integrity of the library environment. And there's also um, confusion I've noticed regarding enforcement of policies and a patron's right to privacy. Um, I've, I've actually had someone tell me that they um, um, had, there was a, a man who they believed to be um, masturbating in the library restroom and because they because of Library Privacy Act they didn't want to do anything about it because of his privacy well that I don't want I want to be very careful about that because what that individual is doing was a crime and it's not protected by the Library Privacy Act and the person doesn't have a right to do that in the library so again I think you've been very um, you know well read and very well well informed about privacy issues and protecting patrons rights but it, there are there is a limit to that and I want I want people to understand that so that they know that it is appropriate to call the police when there's those types of activities occurring at the library uh, and I've given you what a definition of a library record is um, so that you can um, understand what this is because often when you get the police involved the first thing they're going to do is to say well I want to see the um, surveillance tapes or I want to see the, um, the, the checkout records. For example, if someone punches a patron in the face and then, you know, checks out a book on the, you know, on one of your, you know, self-check stations and runs out the door, you know, the library, the police might say, well, well, who was it? You know, we can figure out who that was. You, you know, we saw that they checked out a book at 4.30. So you have to understand that a library record, that would be considered part of a library record. And even if you ask the police for help, they're still going to have to comply with the Library Privacy Act. Um, and what that means is, is that they're going to have to get some sort of court order in order to obtain that information. Um, what is not a library record? Um, personal observations of patrons and personal observations of staff. So the, patron, the staff member can say to the, um, to the, in the, giving the example of the person who punched the other patron and then did the self-checkout, the staff member can say, um, I observed an individual strike another individual in the face. Um, he checked out, um, he used the self-check machine, and then he ran out the door. That's personal observations of the staff. Um, anything that involves the library record, you know, the, the, the information, you know, on the, you know, the checkout machine, for example, would be considered part of the library privacy and would require some sort of court order. Um, the, and so you should understand the procedures for obtaining that court order um, before the incident occurs. Um, you must obtain that court order, and you also have the ability to um, uh, have an opportunity to be heard by the court before you disclose that. Um, it's a little tricky because if they come in with a search warrant, those search warrants are immediately executable. Um, so those are the things that um, those are the things that you might want to discuss with your attorney ahead of time. But here. questions about, you know, what if that person disclosed the library record, if the patron disclosed his own library record, or if someone who was not considered an employee or agent of the library disclosed the record, then I would think that that's not a violation of the Library Privacy Act. Getting back to the question about the township board, which was a little bit harder for me to answer because um, I don't know if the board of the township is considered an agent of the library with respect to their collection of fees, and that's where you may be very careful about what the township should disclose. So, again, the Library Privacy Act applies to the library, employee, or an agent of the library. Um, one of the questions asked is that if a librarian knows the name of the patron from previous library interactions, are they able to um, share the name? And there's another question about this. This is one of the trickiest questions that I get because if you know the name of the person because they're a library, so let's say you work at the circulation desk and they come in every day and you check out books to them every day and so you know their name because they check out books to you every day, you can't just tell them the name because you know that name from library records. Now, if that person happens to live next door to you and you, you know, they've lived next door to you for 20 years and they're your neighbor, if there's a, another way to um, know their name without it being involved in any way with library records, then I think that's acceptable. But that's a really fine line. Um, 
So it's, you have to be very careful about that. Typically, the person is known because they use the library, and in that case, I would not um, give out their name, even if you know it, without looking at the library record. Um, there's a question about um, library record versus video footage. Um, there's, and this, I think there's a couple uh, questions about um, security or about security footage. I'll, I'll give you my opinion. Again, my opinion may not be the same as other other lawyers, so this is one of those things to check with other lawyers. But I'm going to go back a little bit to the definition of what a library record is. It means a document, record, or other method of storing information that contains information that personally identifies a library patron, including their name, address, and telephone number. My thought is that a video camera footage, surveillance footage, that personally identifies that person by sight, by their face, is in the library, would fall under the library record. Sometimes those um, footage is very unclear. You can't really see who it is. Those are harder, um, harder situations. There's one um, attorney general opinion in Wisconsin that held that the video surveillance was a library record under Wisconsin's library privacy law or version of library privacy. And in that case, um, you know, obviously it's not this jurisdiction, but I think it gives us some clue. I guess my, I err on the side of caution and require um, a police um, or court order if um, if a library um, or if we're talking about uh, security footage. Um, and there's really, uh, getting back to some questions, there's really no definition of the agent of a library. You'd have to go back to what common law agency is, and I think we, that's one of those things where you'd have to kind of look at what their role is. Um, um, you know, if you hire, for example, if you hire a collection firm and you give them information to collect fees, I think those would be considered agents of the library. Um, and there's a question about library privacy um, plays when library policies specifically say that the staff will cooperate fully with the law enforcement with regard to any crimes. I think the, the policy should probably read in that case to the extent permitted by law because um, if your policy says you're going to fully cooperate but the Library Privacy Act, which is state law, says they have to have a court order first, I think you're going to, you know, your policy may cause you to be in compliance or in um, conflict with state state law. So that's something I'd, I'd, take, I'd take a look at the way it's worded and make sure that it's consistent with state law. Um, what is a proper court order? Um, anything signed by a judge, obviously, is a court order, judge or magistrate. Um, we've, we've been a little bit, um, again, this is something that you need to get your own lawyer's opinion on, but if you look at the Michigan court rules, they talk about subpoenas being an order of the court, and it's not specifically defined. So oftentimes um, we consider subpoenas at this point to be court orders, but we'll often go through um, the motion to quash or go through the hearing um, if we have a subpoena from another lawyer that's not signed by a judge um, to make sure that the court eventually orders um, release of those documents. So if you receive a subpoena, that's one of those decisions you're going to have to make with your board and with your lawyer as to whether you comply with that subpoena or you um, move to have it quashed or you enforce your ability to have a judge um, take a look at the subpoena, which is, which is allowed under the Michigan Library Privacy Act. And I just want to plug, we're talking about a lot of privacy issues here, I want to plug our, um, our upcoming seminar um, in October. We're going to be doing a similar seminar on library privacy, I believe it's on the 11th and then we're going to send out notice, and then November 10th we're doing employment. So we'll get into this a lot um, also in, in that seminar, get more in-depth into the library privacy issues. Um, but again, we're talking about that opportunity for a hearing to tell your, the judge about the library's concerns, um, and you can address issues about the scope of the request and return of records. So if you get a, if you get a, a subpoena and you go for an opportunity for the hearing, you can often limit the scope of the subpoena. Um, Um, you could, the Library Privacy Act has a uh, waiver provision. You can get a written wa waiver from a person responsible for the payment or return of materials. Um, this was mainly a, developed to assist parents in locating and returning child's materials, but you can actually get the particular patron to waive their library privacy rights if they're willing to do so to help with the police investigation. The penalty for the Library Privacy Act is um, um, civil action for actual damages are $250. I'm not really sure what actual damages would mean in every context. That's why, you know, sometimes people say, well, I'll pay the 250 you know, give me the documents, I'll pay the 250 if that's all it takes. Well, 
I don't know what actual damages are. If someone, if you improperly release, let's say you're dealing with someone who's um, committed a crime in the library, that's the violation of the Library Privacy Act. You, you caught them viewing what you called, you consider child pornography. You gave out the name. It got leaked to the papers. The guy lost his job. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't mean to be too overly sensitive about this, but I don't know what the actual damages would be in that case. That's why I think the $250 um, may be a little misleading. Um, plus reasonable attorney's fees. If you if you end up in litigation, any of you who have ended up in litigation knows it can be expensive. I mean, it, it can be, you know, thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars. So it's not one of those things that I would take lightly based on the $250. And and I, I'm, the reason I point this out is that I often get that comment from the police. Oh, Oh, just give us a document. We'll pay the 250. Ha ha ha. It's not a big deal. Well, I think that you have to be considerate of that issue. Um, this this slide is, and we're running out of time a little bit, so I may not be able to get through all of this. But the, the next the slides will be available um, on our website, and we'll be sending out a notice with all that information after the seminar, so you'll be able to get a full copy of the um, of the materials. You can also um, listen to it on our website again, or you can send it if you're you know, a member of a board and want your other board members to look at it, or if you're, you know, staff and you have other people that are interested, it will be available. You just have to sign up and you can listen to it at your, at your convenience. <clears throat> um, this is the third issue of police involvement that I wanted to talk about with, info if with your patron behavior issues. You may get contacts by the police that you don't know. You may, you may get contacted by the police about a patron and you might not know there was even a violation. This happens most often with computer crimes. Um, the police have um, heard that someone sends a threat, for example, over your internet, or someone is looking at or allegedly looking at child pornography over the internet. Um, you should have a procedure in place that d deals with that that complies with the Library Privacy Act because, you know, when you deal with your own in internal investigation or you're getting prepared to call the police, you often have your ducks in a row before you make that call. You've figured out what you're going to do, tell them what they, they need that court order for you and you, you've got the backup. But you, you may be faced with a situation, your patron does something in the library that you're not aware of, the police may come to your door and ask for the documents. So it's important to understand what, that, what information you can and can't give out. So determine who's going to respond to those, who's in charge, you know, the director's not always going to be there, it's who's, who's in charge when the director's not there, the assistant director, what, what's the chain of the command. Um, who should be contacted? Your attorney, if, if you have outside computer consultants. Um, make sure that um, there's always someone there that can assist you with that type of information. I swear these people come at like 6 o'clock too or right before closing or, or on a Saturday often. So um, it's not like they come at, you know, 10 o'clock on a business day often. So, um, you know, keep in mind who, who, who would be involved, you know, who would be the, in the chain of command at any particular point that you have. Um, the person in charge to understand how to access the records, um, and that's important to t know what's kept if you um, and where it's kept. You know, oftentimes you can say to the police, you know, you can get a court order for this document, but you should understand that we only keep videotape surveillance for 30 days and then they tape over, so we wouldn't have something likely from six months ago. You can get the court order. Make sure that you understand they can get the court order. They can get that, but you know, our internet records, you know, are basically destroyed or tape, you know every time we shut off the computer at night. So understand how, how the records are kept um, and do you need a special computer uh, a specialist? I, you know, I, I'm pretty computer illiterate so I would need a lot of help. Um, some of library, some of the um, records may not be kept at the library level, they may be kept with the cooperative. So some of this stuff is all stuff you should be aware of and, and know. Um, Again, um, we you know we want to talk about pr preservation of the evidence because one of the things that you you have a duty to preserve the evidence once you reasonably know that a search warrant's coming. So if you get contacted by the police too, you should be able to figure out um, how to prevent the destruction of records. So if you know, for example, that your um, records are you know your uh, video surveillance is taped over every 30 days. On uh, day 28, you get a uh, notice from the police that they're going to be getting a search warrant. What you want to do, or some type of uh, court order, what you want to do is to make sure that um, you um, are able to preserve that evidence. So again, knowing where your documents are, knowing how to access them, and knowing how to preserve them if you need to do that, that is going to
going to be important in anticipating this type of um, involvement from the police. Um, ask for identification and contact number, get their business card. If it's a verbal request, you don't have to comply with that. They need some sort of court order. Um, you know, you can ask them, for example, to be allowed to send the copy to the attorney. Um, if, it, if, if it's an immediately executable document, like a search warrant or something like that, or a federal subpoena that you may not have the ability to get attorney review, you know, review it to the best of your ability. Make sure that it's filled in. We, there was one case not involving um, a library, but involving a private entity like a cellular phone company, I think, where the person complied with the court order, but it wasn't signed by anybody. So it wasn't a valid court order, and they gave out the information, and they were sued by the person for giving out the information. So basically, do the best you can with what circumstances you have, but make sure you, you know, make sure they only take what's listed in the court order, um, make sure it's signed by an appropriate official, and make sure at the earliest opportunity you can send that along to your uh, attorney. Again, observe what the officer is seizing. Um, make sure it's only with the information covered in the search warrant. Keep notes about what's taken and keep track of all costs. You want to make sure you get everything back. Um, and you don't always know. I mean, we, we, we've had um, police that have kept library computers, for example, for you know, over a year during the investigation. And if you have 150 computers, that might not be a um, hardship. But in this case, the library only had, um, I think, three or four. And so it was a real hardship. So try to, you know, we need to keep track of, what, of what's taken and make sure that we get it back at the earliest possible time. Again, you might not just be involved with the police. You may be contacted by the media if it's something, you know, there's lots of articles. You just Google library and patrons. There's lots of articles about, especially about patrons who get pornography and such at the library. And so you want to make sure that um, you have a media policy about who should talk to the media and how you should handle requests from the media because the library um, requests from the media are covered by um, the Freedom of Information Act and any library record is exempt from disclosure under FOIA so you can treat them a little bit differently than police but again it's all about anticipating um, the patron, anticipating what happens when your patrons violate their po library policy and, and you don't know about it at the time. Staff training is important, um, and equal enforcement of the policy is important in order to keep um, libraries out of court. That's why typically in the appeals procedure, we recommend that the library um, have only certain people designated to uh, enforce the policy to make sure that it's enforced consistently, consistently and you don't have every single one of your um, staff members, if possible. You know, I know that some staff is limited and each library is different. but um, you um, don't want to make sure that your um, staff, you know, is tr who, whoever on your staff is um, charged with enforcing the policy is properly trained and understands the equal enforcement aspect of it. So if there's no more questions, I think I covered most of the questions. I apologize. I, I see a couple that I haven't done that I will try to do by um, email if I can. Um, after the webinar. Um, so for those of who I didn't get directly, there were a lot of questions that came up at once. I couldn't answer them all. So um, yeah, look for our information on the webinar. We'll send up a follow-up email so you'll have that information and, and you're able to get a copy of the PowerPoint. And certainly if you have any questions that have not been answered, I'll get back to you. If you have any other questions that you haven't answered and want answers to, um, please feel free to give me, um, um, send me an email and I'll be happy to get back to you soon as I can. And thanks very much for your patience and thank you for, for listening and look for our upcoming webinars. Thanks. Bye-bye.